Excellent. Well, I'm glad we're doing this in English because that's the only language I have to offer. So um, <laughs> it might be a bit challenging for myself if we were doing any other. Do you speak any other languages? Let's do it in Chinese. They say gong 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 wa. Okay, I'm not sure how, what I can offer to that. Um, I just want to give a bit of a background on Nuri. I'm sure a lot of you, uh, by Nuri walking around, many of you know him already and have met him before. But let me just go through a little bit of Nuri's past and a lot of his achievements, okay? Um, your, Nuri's now been based in Hong Kong. He's a unique commodity, and he writes his books and columns here. But he's very popular around the world as well. As he mentioned before, he's got a lot of published in Australia, the UK, America, and then here in Hong Kong. Are they the only countries? Yeah, in fact, my, uh, the best-selling best area is, is Germany, which is interesting because I, I don't speak any German. Any Germans here? No, but like I sell zillions in Germany. Germany. Yeah, yeah. And uh, about five years ago, I did a book tour, and I had four stops in Germany. And on one of them, my German translator was there. And I said to her, how come I sell so many books here? And she said, do you want to know the truth? <laughs> I take out all your jokes, and I put in my own. <laughs> so, uh, so I said, yeah, well, keep doing it, you know. And then, uh, then the book tour took me to France. Yeah. And I told this story to my French translator. And she said, darling, we all do that. You can't translate jokes. You have to just replace them with your own jokes. But only the German is honest enough to tell you that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, very interesting, actually. The, um, well, going through a bit of what you've achieved, you... Um, you're a bit of a literary activist. You've been instrumental in setting up Asia's Literary Review, the Hong Kong International Literary Festival, the Man Asian Literary Prize, and you're also the chairman of the Asia Pacific Writers Association, right? Mm -hmm. the, um, and we're reading up on a bit of, um, there's a few tricks up your sleeve. You're thinking of setting up a bit of a new international book prize, but we'll get to that later on. But, and a few other parts about your background. He's a Westerner. All his children are adopted and they're Chinese. You've also got a few cultural complexities in your background with your father being a Muslim, your mother being a Buddhist, and your wife's a Christian. So we'll try and figure out a little bit of that later on. And, um, and then also we'll touch a little bit on, because I myself am from a charity, and a lot of the proceeds Nuri gives of his books to around to good organizations. So we'll touch on that a little bit later. But um, again, can we just give a warm welcome to Nuri Vitachi? Thank you. Yeah. Um, so first of all, Neri, tell us a little bit about what your parents do. Yeah. Oh, going way back. Going, to going all the way back now. The dawn Not of time. how many years, but just how, you don't have to tell me how far back you're going. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, actually, my father was a newspaper man who um, who was always in trouble um, because uh, because he was very honest. And um, we lived in Sri Lanka, and um, what and what happened was that a war broke out in Sri Lanka. Uh, a war between the, the Tamils and the Sinhalese, two races. And um, the Prime Minister put out a decree saying, OK, uh, this is censored. You can't write about this. And this drove my father mad. He said, you can't have a war in your country and not mention it. What am I going to do, write about flower shows or something? So he was furious. And he forced uh, his newspaper to, tr to publish things about the war. And eventually, he wrote a book which was smuggled out of Sri Lanka to London. And it was published. And that's how the world got to know about the Sri Lankan uh, war. And wow. he was so pleased with himself. And um, my mother, who was much wiser, as women are, let's face it, <laughs> said, you just put us on a death list. And my father said, no, no, no. I'm a, I'm a superstar now, who published by a big, famous publisher in the UK. And uh, it turned out my mother was right, because uh, we were promptly put on, the, put on a list of people to be disappeared. And so, uh, uh, so one night it got really bad, and my, my father got this call from the chief of police. One great thing about being a journalist is that journalists get to know famous people, even though they're not very famous themselves. They might be nobodies, but they get to know famous people. So he knew the chief of police. And the chief of police rang up and said, uh, I have been ordered um, to arrest you. Make sure you're not at home when I get there. So uh, my father put down the phone and said to the children, um, 
come on, kids, get your shoes on. We're going for a walk. And so I was putting my shoes on. I was, you know, I was this big. And then the phone rang again, and it was the Minister of Immigration, who was a cousin. And uh, he said, um, I've been ordered to take away your passports, so why don't you use them? So my father put the phone down and said, children, t get your teddy bears. We're going for a long walk. <laughs> so I can remember we, we, uh, we got in the car and started driving. <clears throat> and uh, I said, I remember saying to my father, um, why are we going driving in the middle of the night? And he said, because there's less traffic. <laughs> I'm like, for a kid that makes sense. But now looking back at it, I think that's so dumb. <laughs> But uh, anyway, we went to the airport, and my father went up to the counter and said, uh, I want five tickets. And she <laughs> said, where to? And he said, I don't care. What's the next plane? Five tickets. You've got to go somewhere. So the check-in girl said, well, the next plane is to Singapore. So he said, five tickets to Singapore will be just fine. So we got on the plane, and off we went to Singapore. And, um, and then, of course, we couldn't go back to Sri Lanka for a, for a long time. So my father was a troublemaking journalist, as a quick answer to your question. Yeah. And uh, so I like to follow in his footsteps. I've failed, really, though, because I've never been followed by men with guns. Yeah, so. I was going to say, you know, <laughs> yeah. that's a tough path to follow. So fleeing censorship, you actually went to Singapore with your whole family? Yeah. Hmm. Actually, when you put it like that, yeah. fleeing censorship to Singapore... Doesn't really make much sense, really, does it? Yeah. <laughs> it's a bit like that guy, Ed Edward Snowden. Have you followed that story in the paper? Like, when that story broke, right, his first quote, did you see that in The Guardian? He said, I cannot live in a country where the government spies on the people, so I'm going to China. <laughs> I thought, I'm reading this and I'm thinking, huh? And then he gets to, to Hong Kong, and then he gives an interview to the South China Morning Post, and did you see what he said? He said... I must go to a country which is free and democratic. Then he goes to Russia. You know? <laughs> and I'm reading this, I'm thinking, boy, this guy, he makes some bad decisions in his life. <laughs> did, so you didn't think of trying to get in on the Snowden Act and doing some, did you do any work on it? Yeah, well, funnily enough, he was staying in the Mirror Hotel, which is just around the corner from my office. So I, I did think about sort of lurking around, but uh, apparently I heard that he's, a, he's very paranoid he only uses the computer uh, with a blanket over his head. So he goes and sits down, he puts his, his blanket or duvet over his head and then types on his computer in case, you know, spies are using distant cameras through the window to, to watch him. So, uh, yeah, so um, uh, a rather confused young man, yeah, so I think. That's kind of like his own firewall. That's right, his own it's, it's, it's own little firewall that he creates. That's right. okay. yeah. So explain to us the British accent. Where does the British accent? Because, <laughs> right. you know, we'll touch on your book later on about Asian humor. But, you know, I, I was thinking maybe the, the British accent, that's where the humor is originated? Or yeah. what's the story there? I mean, there's, there's lots of humor in, in language. Like, uh, you know, I learned, you know, I learned English. As a kid, I, I learned English and Sinhalese and Tamil. And... Um, you know, most Asians, like most of this audience, I'm sure you learnt a English out of a book, right? Right? And what, do, what does every English book say? It says, all English people begin conversations like this. How do you do? And then you reply, fine, thank you. How do you do? And that's how I learnt English. And then when we, got, when we escaped from Sri Lanka, eventually, after a few years travelling, we went to London, <clears throat> and uh, I tried it there. How do you do? You know, actually, I had a Sri Lankan accent then, so it was more like, how do you do? <clears throat> anyway, the, uh, anybody here been to London? Any Londoners here? Okay, a few Londoners. You know what the correct greeting is in London? You know, if you say, how do you do? They say, how do we do what? <laughs> the correct greeting in London is, watcha. They all say, watcha. And, um, Eventually, I asked them, um, you know, what does it mean, watcha? And uh, nobody knew, which was interesting, because they said it 20 times a day. Then I went to New York, where my brother lived, <coughs> and uh, tried it there. How do you do? But it doesn't work. Any New Yorkers here, or Americans? Yeah, you know what Americans say, you know. 
They, or they say, in America, New York, they say, yo. You know. So I asked them, what does yo mean? And again, nobody knew. Then we got on a plane, came to Hong Kong. And you know, I was reading in my book, all Hong Kongers begin every conversation like this, lei hao ma. And then you have to reply, ho ho, lei la. You know, so I practice on the plane, and I get here, and nobody says this. They say, wei di ma. <laughs> I eventually asked my Hong Kong friends, what does it mean, wei di ma? And they said, it, it means yo. You know? <laughs> So there we, there, we, there we have it. So uh, language, never trust a language book, okay? Just never trust a language book. In fact, in my, my best-selling book, Feng Shui Detective, mm -hmm. uh, the, all the characters speak their own brand of English. So there's a Chinese character, an Indian character, a Western character, and they all speak their own brands of English. And of course, the Western character and the Chinese character don't understand each other at all. Uh, until the, the Asian eventually, who's based on me, of course, the Asian eventually works out that the English word for yes is not yes. The English word for yes is whatever. Because that's what English people say, isn't it? If you ask them to, if they approve of something. And then there's three phrases for no. So English people, they don't say no. They say either as if or in your dreams or the most confusing of it all, they say yeah, right. That one really bugs me because, like, to an Asian, yeah, right means yes, correct. But to an English speaker, yeah, right means no, wrong. You know? So, yeah, tricky, tricky the whole language thing. Yeah, very true. The quick question how many of you guys here would be working within the creative industry? Or well, any ready? writers or would be writers, should we say, or people who. Yeah, because one of my questions would be, um, how, what is it like trying to um, base a living, especially here in Asia, of being a writer? Good, good and bad. I mean, probably some of you can add, add comments there. Uh, the, <clears throat> the, the bad thing is that being a writer or a creative person anywhere is tough. Making a living by, by doing a fun thing like singing or painting or writing stories, any creative industry is tough. It's tough in any part of the world. Um, so I, I won't say it's easy. Um, in fact, I was up at uh, Canadian International School and they were having a parent's day and each parent had to talk about their job. And the lawyer said, oh yes, I'm a lawyer. It's so cool being a lawyer. And the banker said the same thing. You know, and it got to me and I said, you know, I'm a writer, if you want to make any money, don't be a writer. You know, it's, you know, creative jobs are always second jobs. People always, they write or they draw or they paint or they sing as a hobby. Mm -hmm. And then when you've done your fifth book or your sixth album or your 10th painting and they start to sell, then you can become a full-time creative artist. So being a writer, being a creative person is very difficult. Um, anywhere. But, now here's the good side, doing it in Asia is much easier than other places. We have two massive advantages. Number one, we have a market. You know, more people live in Asia than, than in the rest of the world. Four billion people live in Asia. Three billion people live outside Asia. Okay, so we have the majority of the world's population. So we have a market. And number two, there's no competition. I mean, name a write, an international writer, internationally published writer, who lives in Hong Kong. Well, name one who lives in Asia. It's really hard to think of one, isn't it? You know, I ask people, name any Asian writer. And usually, I get a few scratched heads, and then they'll say, Salman Rushdie? Mm -hmm. But like, he's from Hampstead in London. And then they say, Amy Tan? Amy Tan is a classic San Francisco writer. Uh, Maxine Hong Kingston, California. You know, there are almost zero international writers uh, from Asia. So what an opportunity. I mean, consider the movie industry. Uh, uh, Asia has the biggest movie industries in the world, okay? I mean, in terms of seats sold, box office, you know, Bollywood and the Asian, East Asian industries are massive. But screenplay writers, 
I mean, you can tell by looking at Asian movies, there aren't any screenplay writers, you know. They've got lots of special effects, they've got actors, they've got budgets, but the screenplay writers are missing. Where are they? So, uh, you know, there's huge opportunity for Asian writers. So I want to encourage those of you who are writers to, 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 to take this opportunity. Did you ever think of going into any other uh, niche of the creative industry, yeah. like yeah. singing or... Singing. Film industry, you know, was, or was it always going to be following your father's footsteps? Right. New York, New York. Mm. Yeah, no, I can't sing. But um, <laughs> other creative industries, well, I mean, the movie industry is, a, is an attractive one, um, <clears throat> except, um, I don't know, is it, I, I know a lot of screenwriters, and it's quite frustrating being a screenwriter here. Um, one of the problems is... That, uh, Books are not censored. Have you noticed that? But movies are. Mm -hmm. Movies are always censored, but books never are. Uh, you know, there's no, there's no 18 and only certificate on a book. There is on music, there is on movies, but never on a book. Uh, same with politics. You can say, you can get away with anything on a book, but you can't in movies. I mean, I worked on a movie in Beijing a, about a year and a half ago, and it was just, uh, the censorship was just mm -hmm. a complete nightmare. You so know. you've got a bit more freedom within just writing, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, they don't, I, d I don't know why it is, perhaps someone can, can comment, but why do books not get censored? Why do movies get censored? You know, there's too many books for them to read, yeah. Yeah. Because it reaches more people, the movie, more easily. Yeah, I think these reasons are probably true. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. I mean, yeah, sorry. Books are more open to interpretation. Yeah, mm. interesting, yeah. But no, I wouldn't say that. I disagree with that. <laughs> no, that's a that's a that's a famous Asian myth. I think the teachers tell you that. Some <laughs> bad teachers, not good teachers. Bad <laughs> teachers tell you that. But no, no, books are for enjoying, just like movies and and. Uh, or maybe people, maybe the government thinks books are for learning. <laughs> therefore, they don't censor them. That might be. That might be. I mean, let let me give you an example of this Beijing movie. Right. Um, the first rule was. Um, um, no, nobody who works for the government can be evil in the movie. Now that makes it tricky, this was a crime movie, so no corrupt government officials, no corrupt policemen, and nothing like that. You know, all the police, all the government agents, the public security, the government had to be clean. Okay, so wow, that makes it difficult to write this story. The second stage, <coughs> we've decided that nobody of, um, Nobody of Chinese ethnic background can be evil. <laughs> now, this movie is set in Beijing. So he said, well, you know, you need a bad guy in a movie. And so we had to write the script so that uh, a Westerner from Europe flies in, commits a crime, flies out, and then the good Chinese folk have to track you down yeah. because you're evil. But was he you're Irish? Western. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So it sounds like a joke, but I can show you the script, you know. Is this going to be a wildly successful movie? I don't think so. Yeah. <laughs> True. Mind you, a lot of the movies I watch are similar, but they pick on different nationalities at the same time, right? Yeah, yeah. The, um, did you work in, in London itself? Or were you yeah. just, yeah? <clears throat> I, worked in, uh, I worked in Fleet Street in London. Uh, which is the main newspaper area. And um, people say bad things about the UK press uh, all the time, uh, you know, Murdoch and people. And I agree, Murdoch is, you know, maybe the world's most evil human being. Mm -hmm. But um, the newspapers are very lively. They're really fun and they do lots of crazy things. Yeah. I actually worked for the News of the World at one stage oh, really? for, for Murdoch. And, you know, the commands we get, we got were <laughs> ludicrous, you know. Go and climb a tree outside this house and watch, you know, yeah. so like, because such and such a celebrity is in there. You know, it was, it was crazy, but uh, it was very good training. 
yeah, for yeah. a reporter. It's not a good time for News of the World at the moment, right? Yeah, they've been closed down <laughs> yeah. for being too naughty. Yeah, yeah true. Yeah. And so when, when about what brought you to Hong Kong? When, when did you yeah. move back to Asia? Yeah. <coughs> Yeah, so um, when I was in my 20s, I married an English woman, and we went on honeymoon, uh, sort of around the world, came here, and fell in love with Hong Kong. And uh, so this is the 25th year of our honeymoon. So uh, our wedding presents are still untouched uh, back in London, waiting for our return. You didn't go home. Yeah, well, we've been home for visits, <laughs> but... Uh, but, uh, yeah, they're all, st you know... I mean, who wants a 1986 toaster now? It's so out of date, you know. Perhaps in another 20 years, it'll be interesting. We can sell it to a museum or something. Yeah, you could go back towards the old toasters. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah excellent. Retro. So um, let's go back let's, and talk about a few of your books. So bring us through the... Your breakthrough book would be The Feng Shui Detective. Yeah, yeah. Um, you talked a little bit about the different characters, but... Um, how, how was that uh, received by the Hong Kong audience? Yeah, or was it yeah. more international based? Or was all the Germans buying it? <laughs> right, yeah. um, you know, one of the great advantages we have here is that um, we have a new story to tell. I mean, if you think, if you go to the bookshop, you'll find it's full of geopolitical thriller set in the USA. It's full of crime detective stories set in the UK. Okay, P.D. James and Agatha Christie and all these people, Tom Clancy. Um, it's like there are only two countries in the world. There's UK and US, and all stories happen there. It's almost the same in movies, too. Everything happens in the US and the UK, but there are 200 countries in the world, and the vast majority, 90% of people, do not live in the US and the UK. So um, here's our opportunity here. So with the Feng Shui detective, I thought uh, Feng Shui or Feng Shui, as we say in Hong Kong, is, a, um, is something that fascinates everybody. It fascinates um, Westerners, uh, fascinates uh, Asians. Um, Indians love it. I mean, Indians claim, I, mean, I might get into trouble here, but Indians believe they invented it and they have a very ancient type of Feng Shui uh, in India. Um, called Vastu, and they believe that uh, the Chinese borrowed it and changed it. Uh, but the Chinese are better at marketing, so Feng Shui is much more famous than, than the Indian one. But anyway, um, I, was reading, uh, I was reading a property, I was reading a newspaper, and there was a property page, and there was an article about a murder. When somebody dies in... Hong Kong or Taiwan or Singapore, the property dealer will hire a feng shui master as well as the detective. The detective comes, check for fingerprints. The feng shui master comes to feel the harmony and vibrations to see what went wrong and how it can be fixed. So I thought, hmm, this is a real character. What if the feng shui master and the uh, detective raced to find out who the killer was. Um, this idea became a series of books called The Feng Shui Detective. Um, but it was successful, I think, because the detective novel business had reached a, a big problem. The problem was CSI. Um, have you seen this TV show? Yeah. Uh, what happened was that all the crime investigation came into the laboratory. It was all about DNA analysis. It was not about people and emotion. You know, it was about science. Uh, and so detective writers found this too boring and um, didn't know what to do. But the Feng Shui detective is about human harmony. Uh, again, uh, what are the relationships between in the house? How did the harmony get spoiled? And how can you fix the harmony? So return it to a, to a human uh, story. Yeah. Has, has everyone read any of the, the books? Yeah. yeah. You got any comments or questions or favorite characters that Nuri spoke about? Do you want your money back? Oh, great. Mm. Okay. 
okay. And then, so after that one, so it was it just recently that you've actually started to divert towards children's books now. Yeah, yeah. Now, what what made you kind of divert from the detective? Was it CSI came out and then <laughs> okay, I got to think of something new, or <laughs> what brought you towards going towards the children's books? Yeah, I mean, I've always felt sorry for. Well, I, I was organising the Hong Kong Literary Festival, and every year we have a children's department, and I could not find any children's authors in Asia. So we imported them from London, from New York, from Australia. Every year we imported children's book writers. So I, so I thought, this is terrible. There must be some children's book writers here. There were a small number of little writers. What I mean is they published locally only, but the books were just terrible, just terrible. Children's books are hard to write. They're harder than adult books. You need fantastic art. You need their words to be chosen very carefully. They have to have a certain magic in them. You can't just write a cute story about a cat. You could have some magic. I mean, let me give you an example. A um, hundred years ago, an author wrote a book about a teddy bear. And what did he call him? Mr. Bear. Uh, first name? Teddy. Okay, this is how adults think. In the room was a kid, and the kid said, that name's boring call him Winnie. And the guy said, Winnie is a girl's name. And the kid said, I want him to be called Winnie. Okay, okay, Mr. Winnie Bear. <laughs> I want him to be called Mr. Pooh. So you can imagine what the adult would have said. <laughs> Pooh, this is a bad word. You know what poo means? You can't call him poo. But the kid insisted. And so Mr. Teddy Bear became Winnie the Pooh. Now, this is child magic. Do you think Winnie the Pooh would have become the most famous children's book character in the world uh, had he been called Mr. Teddy Bear? No way. Only a kid could have thought of the name Winnie the Pooh. And this is what kids have this magic that most adults don't have. So children's books are hard to write. You have to plug into this magic. <clears throat> and uh, that's why Asia has no good children's book writers. I mean, they're just starting to appear now, but certainly 10 years ago, they had zero. Um, <clears throat> so um, I w got into children's books, and um, I used to test them. Right, so right, right, this page is funny. This page is scary. Uh, this page will make them go, <gasps> and so on. And then I would go to schools, and I would read the funny page, and nobody would laugh. Then I'd read the scary page, everybody would laugh. <laughs> and uh, so on. So I made it a tradition. Every time I wrote a children's book, I would go to lots of schools and just read it. And then I would just change everything, change everything, just rewrite the whole thing. Uh, and then it became child friendly. Um, and so, so I started writing children's books. I got a contract with uh, Scholastic, which is a very big famous children's book publisher. And um, so at the moment, I'm doing a lovely series for them on Chinese history. Chinese history is so boring, and the <laughs> books are so boring. But the actual events are very interesting. So I'm working with a Chinese writer, and we are doing a book on all the interesting things in Chinese history, but making them fun and interesting. Like, for example, the Great Wall of China. Uh, last month, we had to do a book about the Great Wall of China. So we thought, oh, that sounds kind of boring. So we did our research, and we found that 100,000 people were killed building the wall, and then their skeletons were added to the bricks. I saw, ah, yeah. So uh, we thought, well, we can't put that in a children's book, you know. So my, my partner said, that's There's scary. no censorship, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> On books. Yeah, this, I mean, we could technically, I suppose, but we said that would be too scary for, ki for kids. Uh, and so my partner said, well, what do we do? Do we censor it? And we couldn't do that, you know. So in the end, we just did more and more research, and we eventually found this wonderful ghost story. Some of you, I'm sure, will know this. A woman who got married, and on the day of her wedding, the, soldier, the emperor's men came, took the husband away, to build the wall, along with thousands of other laborers. So she waited for him to return. He never came back. So she sewed a jacket for him and went to the Great Wall. And um, there she found the truth that all these men were being worked to death. So she climbed up onto the wall 
and sat there and wept. And she soaked that whole area of the wall with her tears because she just cried and cried and cried. And then that wall began to crumble because it was wet and the cement wasn't dry yet. And then she saw among the bricks a skull. And she realized, it's my husband. You know, who knows if it was her husband or not. But it just, and you know, of course the legend, uh, and then the emperor heard about this woman and the emperor said, bring me this woman whose tears can destroy my wall. And the emperor met the woman and said, will you marry me? Because emperors collect interesting women, that's what they do. <laughs> and she said, uh, yes, I'll marry you if, uh, if you do one thing. Um, take me to the sea, I've never seen the sea. So the emperor put her on his boat and they went out to the sea and she walked to the edge of the boat and jumped in and uh, so stole, so, so, so she wanted to cause pain to the emperor because he'd caused pain to her. <clears throat> and, then they, and then it said that at nights her ghost walks along the wall and you can hear her weeping, you can hear the splash of tears. And there's a statue of her on the, on the Great Wall now um, to represent all the people who died. So we thought, okay, that's a really great ghost story. Uh, and it's full of nobility and pain and you know, drama. Uh, so we based the story around her story. So, um, so that's what I mean. I, you know, it's, uh, China's full of amazing stories like that, uh, you know, that don't get, don't get told. You know. was, it, was it received well? Uh, yep, yep. The, um, the, this series has been launched in several countries and has, has sold out, basically. And it'll be launched in Hong Kong probably end of the year. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. And do you enjoy, do you enjoy the, the children's books, the niche? Yeah, because, um, you know, Asia has these great stories which are just untold. I mean, a lot of Asians don't know these stories. You know, they're such, they're such great stories. Um, for example, you know the story about heaven and hell, where somebody goes to hell and the spoon, and they see a, see a banqueting table, and um, everyone's got spoons which are too big. So they get the food, but it's really hard to get it in their mouth. And then uh, the angel takes the person to heaven, and it's exactly the same. Same food, same spoons. But everyone is feeding each other, so they're all happy. You know, that's a famous tale. Tchaikovsky used it. I think Dickens used it. So many people use that story. But that's an ancient Asian story. Um, Cinderella. You know, that story is so famous around the world. That's a Chinese story. You know, that's, uh, uh, that story always intrigued me, Cinderella, because all uh, fairy tales are about a woman who marries a prince because she is beautiful or smart or both. Cinderella is the only story where a woman marries a prince because of the size of one of her body parts. You know, you never see a story where my elbow is 30 centimeters, I will marry you. you know, it doesn't make sense. But I traced back the story of Cinderella and the oldest version was written in the year 800 in China. In China, the story at last makes sense because the size of a woman's foot will determine if she can marry a prince. So suddenly the story made sense. So you can see these great stories come from Asia, but you know, they get they get changed. Now, um, as an experiment, uh, I teach students at university here, and uh, you know, I say, um, Cinderella, where's that story from? Who wrote it? And about 50% say Walt Disney wrote it. <laughs> and the other 50% say it comes from Europe, which is the, the origin of many fairy tales. But none of them have ever said, it's our story, it comes from here, it comes from this part of the world, you know. So, uh, you know, this has to be fixed. Yeah, it's very interesting to actually have a voice to represent the, the cultures of Asia and actually th maybe the pieces that have been stolen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very yeah. much so. So the next, your, your most recent book, the, the Curious Diaries of Mr. Jam, has anyone read that? 
So, okay, we've got a faithful reader down in the middle. <laughs> you know, <laughs> he's got through them all since he's been here. Now, this is a book about Asian humor. Yeah. So, tell us a little bit about. Uh, we've got you've got some slides here behind us that you're going to bring us through as well. But how did you go down towards that? Because I remember when I met you for a coffee and you were telling us about it. I was very interested of how you're going to wiggle through that story. But yeah. What inspired you to do it as well? I should say that Jason here, who's a gentleman in the white shirt, uh, not only has read that book, but actually helped me write it, because it's a, it's a collection of stories from a, a nice group of people uh, in Hong Kong. But um, we believed that, you know, there's a, uh, if, you, if you look at surveys of who are the funniest people in the world, you know who's bottom of the list? Asians are bottom of the list. And right at the very, very bottom uh, are, are um, communists and the last one, Muslims. Muslims are considered the least funny people in the world. Uh, Chinese people are also considered very low on the list. And I saw one survey, which, in, which was a survey of Chinese people and Western people. The Western people said they were quite funny, Chinese people were not funny. The Chinese people said the same thing. They said, Westerners are much funnier than we are. So generally, Asians are considered not funny. Anyway, I read these surveys. I was really annoyed. I said, we are funny. My friends are funny. My children are funny. We're all funny. So uh, I thought, we're going to have to investigate this. And um, so I spent a year studying this subject. Uh, I wrote lots of jokes. And I went to India, went to Beijing, went to Shanghai, went to Indonesia, and told these jokes in public meetings to see who laughed at what. And um, it started off very badly because nobody laughed at anything. But slowly I started to learn what made different communities laugh. And it got funnier and funnier. And soon people were sending me hundreds of jokes. Um, it turns out that the communists are actually quite funny. They have lots of jokes, lots of jokes about communism even. And the biggest surprise was Muslims. Muslims are hilarious. They have loads of jokes and very ancient jokes, much older than Western jokes. Um, one guy sent me three jokes written by the Prophet Muhammad. So I thought, uh-oh, if I print this, is somebody going to blow up my office? <laughs> so I phoned up my imam friends and said, did Muhammad write these three jokes? And they said, yeah, he did. It's famous. He wrote three jokes. Jesus didn't write jokes. <laughs> Buddha didn't write jokes. You know? So I printed these three jokes from Muhammad, and they were okay. You know? I, mean, um, I found some ancient jokes which were very much like Monty Python, even. Um, uh, any Monty anybody seen Monty Python here or heard of Monty Python? Monty Python is a famous British humor series. And uh, one of their most famous jokes is a conversation between some guys. And they're trying to say how bad they are. You know, this is British humor, really. And one guy says, my life was so terrible. I used to live in a dustbin. And the next guy says, I dreamed of living in a garbage bin. I had to live in a shoebox. And the next guy says, oh, my dearest wish to be living in a shoebox, and so on, you know, and they just say how bad their lives are. Anyway, I'm reading an ancient text from China from about the year 900, and it's a group of Buddhists sitting in a monastery talking about how bad they were. And one says, um, you know, I am just, uh, I am a donkey. I'm not a human. I'm so low. And the next one says, I dream of being a donkey. I'm what comes out of a donkey's butt. And then the third one says, donkey, what comes out of a donkey's butt? That's what I want to be. I am a worm inside what comes out of a donkey's butt. And so on, you know. Anyway, I'm reading this now thinking, hang on a minute. This is the same joke. Just a thousand years difference, you know. Um, so that proves to me that everybody is funny and that... Um, it's, uh, uh, you know, we all share humor, really. Yeah. Yeah. It's like you said, when you're, when you're going through the different audiences, it's like when you're going through with the children's books mm -hmm. and you're trying to test actually how the audience receives each other. Did you have to change the humor as you went along to, to Indonesia and all the different countries? 
Um, yeah, not not very much uh, is is the is, a, is a, the quick answer to that. Um, people uh, people all like situation humor, mm -hmm. if you like. So uh, so and uh, um, so we all we we actually do. Humanity has a shared sense of humor. The same thing makes us all laugh in yeah. them. So yeah, there are little changes. Like for example, light bulb jokes don't work in Asia. You know, how many people does it take to change a light bulb? The reason why they don't work in Asia is that the answer you expect is zero, and the answer is never zero. But in Asia, places are always overstaffed or understaffed. Yeah. So 10 people to change a light bulb, that's kind of normal. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. True, true, true. So the so this book actually you've decided to give the profits away to a charity. I know this because it's the charity I volunteer with. <laughs> what inspired you to do that? I wasn't paying you any bribes. I don't think Cherry gave you any bribes. <laughs> so what what was your inspiration towards channeling the profits, ch challenging, ch channeling the profits towards charity? What inspired you to have you done it with any other books or was this a new yeah, yeah. thing? Um, you know, um, what, one of the things about creative industries is that. Um, um, it's a financial struggle uh, because um, when you're starting off, uh, uh, books, music, you don't make much money from creative products. So you've got to just do it for love until you be become quite famous. Um, when I first started, my first book was, what, 20-something years ago, and I saw how much money was coming in. You know, it was, I think I made, well, d a few tens of thousands of dollars, shall we say, from a, from a book. That was just a book in one city, just in Hong Kong. And I thought, hmm, it's not a huge amount of money for a year's work. Um, so um, why don't I, uh, instead of, I'll make my living doing something sensible and I'll send the book profits to do something good, you know. So I turned up at a, have you heard of a place called the Home of Loving Faithfulness? Yeah. Mm. Anybody heard of that home of loving faithfulness? You have, yeah. It's a it's a orphanage for severely disabled kids in the New Territories. Anyway, so I thought, right, uh, I'll give give the money to them. So I turned up at this orphanage, knocked at the door, and said, "I have a check for you." Uh, and uh, and she said, "Right, good, yeah. We were expecting you. Come and sit down. Uh, want some tea?" So I said, "How were you expecting me?" And they said. <coughs> Oh, we ran out of money this morning. We were doing the accounts, so we prayed that somebody would come with a check. So here you are. <laughs> so I thought, wow, that is spooky, you know. So that kind of started a tradition. So every time I wrote a book, you know, I would dedicate uh, the money to, to to something. And um, actually, I need to throw something back at you. This is Peter is being uh, a great interviewer, but he's actually. Uh, one of the linchpins of an absolutely amazing uh, organization called ICM, which deals with very uh, poor uh, people. Uh, a lot of the operations are in parts of the rural Philippines mm -hmm. and uh, some in, in, in other places. Uh, but it's just an absolutely stunning organization. And when I stumbled on it and heard about it, I just thought it's one of those things that you hear about and you think, wow, I have to be involved with this. So, um, yeah, look up, is it Caremin? Is it Caremin, yeah. C A R E M I N, caremin.com. It's absolutely amazing uh, charity organization. And um, I was so inspired that not only did I dedicate my book profits to, the, to, to them, but uh, we had a few, few of us organized some, some ch young people in Hong Kong to go to uh, one of your, your centers, and it was, uh, it was amazing. Yeah. yeah. What, was, what was the. When you went down to the center, what was it like? What was what was your experience or your, what did you, yeah. what was what was it like for you and your family to go down together yeah. to the Philippines? We had like twenty teenagers, right? And you know what Hong Kong teenagers are like? They're so spoilt, and mine were the worst of them all. You know, so <laughs> I didn't say that though. Okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no Facebook, <laughs> not going. Anyway. Uh, so we decided we would make them do the worst possible job. We said, right, all you kids, you're flying down to the Philippines, you're going to the poorest village in the poorest district in the Philippines, and you're going to dig toilets. And they were utterly horrified. <laughs> and they said, will there be Wi-Fi? You know? <laughs> and I said, no, this is the jungle. 
they are probably still on WAP. You know? <laughs> and, um, so we go down to the, the, the jungle and give them spades and they dig toilets. And do you know what happens? Well, you know what kids are like. They soon find the joy in it. And soon they're fighting over the spades mm. and they're having great fun digging. And then they make friends with all the village kids and then they go off and play basketball with them. And they had the best time of their lives. And I said, look, you agree this is the best holiday you've ever had. And what did you do? You spent the time digging toilets in a poor village. You know? uh, uh, is this better than the last holiday I had where we, you know, we stayed in a resort in the Shangri-La? Mm. And they said, this is 100 times better. And I thought, mm, that's good. That's going to save me some <laughs> money. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So, yeah, if anybody wants a life-changing experience, caremin.com, okay? And get this guy to take you on one of his, uh, his charity we trips. We can bring you down. <laughs> the, um, going, going back to, the, to your, your heritage, your family. Now, we talked about it at the start. So your father was a Muslim. Your mother was a Buddhist, and your wife's a Christian. So uh, where does, and then <laughs> you've traveled from um, Sri Lanka to Singapore yeah. to the UK, everything. So whereabouts does that all fit into yeah, things yeah. for yourself? So, yeah, so I'm a mixed up kid, I guess. Um, yeah. Thing is, I was, a, I was always a scientist in the family, and I still, to this day, read New Scientist uh, and all the science books and publications, uh, always have done. And one of my day jobs is I actually teach... Uh, um, MSc students in a science university. So I've always been obsessed with science. And, um, and uh, so whenever I meet my, my, my family members, be they Christian or Muslim or, or Buddhist, I always listen to them because uh, it's fascinating. I don't know any, any other scientists or, or religious people here. It's fascinating. I find that the links like, hmm, let me give you uh, an example. Um, you know, um, uh, the, the tradition in, in uh, like, like I, mean, I mean, religious people, we think, scientists will say, oh, they have wacko ideas like, you know, like God. But if you actually do a survey of science, science writers, you find the majority of them now believe in consciousness outside uh, Earth. And the trend now, and this is fascinating to, to look at, is universal consciousness. The universe itself is conscious, you know, and that's just another name for God. You know, you can call it what you like. It's just another name for God. Um, one of my favorite branches of physics is quantum mechanics, which is, and people say it's complicated. It's not as complicated as you think, but quantum mechanics, to, to explain it in a sentence, there are these two guys, uh, Niels Bohr and Einstein, and they were looking at atoms. And whenever they looked at an atom, it disappeared. And they spent 20 years trying to work out what was happening. And Niels Bohr eventually solved it. He said that when you look at an atom, it disappears because the act of seeing it creates it. And Einstein had a big row saying, that is so ludicrous. And they rowed for 30 years over this. And all the other scientists dived in and said, "How can? have you heard of Schrodinger's cat? That was part of the same experiment. Because Schrodinger said, the cat doesn't exist until you open the box and see the cat. It was all part of the same experience. But anyway, all the scientists now agree that Einstein was wrong. Um, reality doesn't exist until an observer has seen it. But who's the observer? Nobody knows. Uh, the world, the universe came out of a blob this big. But who observed that blob? If you read modern science books or quantum mechanics, they say the causal agent observed it and it came into being. You know, I don't mind being a scientist using words like causal agent, but if my wife or uncle or aunt wants to use the word God for causal agent, I'm fine with that. I'm fine with that. You know, so science, science and religion at the deepest level uh, agree. And in fact, I'm happy to admit that science gets there earlier than, I mean, religion gets there earlier than, 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 than scientists do. I mean, one of the most stunning ones is if you look at, there's an ancient Indian book called the Rig Veda. Have you heard of this? It was written before the Old Testament. It's very, very old. And there's a wonderful passage in it which says, before there was the universe, there was nothing, not even empty space. 
That's what it says in the Rig Veda. You've heard of the theory of the Big Bang, mm. developed in the 50s. What does that say? It says, before the universe came into existence, there was nothing, not even empty space. It's exactly the same as the Rig Veda said uh, 3,500 years ago. You know? So there are, there are a hundred stories I can tell you like this where religion and science are exactly in tune on the most complex uh, uh, points of, of describing uh, reality. So, um, um, I mean, it's no, it's no secret that I'm raising my family as Christians simply because, uh, um, actually, we try to be Muslims, but uh, Muslims is hard work for kids. Have you ever tried that? Any Muslims here? Uh, we went to a Muslim place and they said, um, uh, you have to be over 17. And my kid was six months at the time. So I said, you mean we can't get back in here for 17 years? And they said, no, sorry. So, um, so somebody said, get me Christians, they're friendly. So we did a bit of faith shopping. We went to all these different faiths. I even went to the Hare Krishnas. The Hare Krishna, have you ever been to a Hare Krishna meeting? Yeah? You do a lot of singing, don't you? You sing the same thing like 25 times, right? And like, hmm? More than that, right, right, yeah. yeah. And like, I just thought, this is not for me. <laughs> you know? um, and uh, and this is the Christians were just so friendly that we just, you know, that, that was it really. The, um, okay, so bring it back. I mentioned at the start, there's, there's talk around the UK about the, a new international prize you might be setting up. So <laughs> yeah. bring us through that there briefly. Yeah. And how are we doing for time, actually? I haven't got yeah. a watch It's actually, here. we've got a couple of minutes. So we'll, we'll go into audience time now. Okay. But yeah, let's just uh, we mentioned this. Um, you've heard of the Booker Prize and the Pulitzer Prize. These things annoy me like crazy because you'll see an article in the, in the, in the paper saying, the Booker Prize, the world's greatest literature of the year, or, or the Pulitzer Prize. They're not the world's greatest book. You have to have an American passport to win the Pulitzer Prize. That means the rest of the world is not even eligible. The Booker Prize, you have to have a British passport or a Commonwealth passport to win the Booker Prize. It's not a world prize at all. And I know these guys, you know, I set up the Man Asian Prize, which is the Booker Prize for, for, for Asia, which is now defunct. Uh, so we're replacing it with something called the World Readers Award. Um, and I don't care what passport you have, you are eligible. If you write a story, you are eligible to send your story in for this prize, okay? So worldreadersaward.com or worldreadersprize.com will give you the information. We'll be launched in, in August this year. I did not know that about the passports. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Did anyone else know that? <laughs> no? Yeah, it's outrageous. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, d does anyone else have, would you want to open up the floor now for a few minutes of any questions that anyone may have of Nuri about any of his books or his story or his past? Yes. Uh, We've got a microphone as well, if you want, so we can all. May I ask, uh, may I ask you uh, about, you mentioned you are uh, writing a uh, children, uh, train to children book, uh, writer. Uh, what age around uh, the, you know, the, the kid, can read your books. Oh, right, right. You know, I have some books for small children, but uh, books for under sevens usually are mostly pictures. So um, uh, they're, they're uh, you know, if you want to be a children's book writer, you have to, you have, to have a great artist buddy. Uh, and then the middle group is the eight to twelves, which are, usually have some illustrations. So I do quite a few books for that age group. And then above, above 13, um, usually the, the line blurs. So Feng Shui Detective, for example, is read by teenagers and by adults, you know. But uh, if you do want to write for young people, you know, do your research carefully, because these different divisions are quite important. So picture books for under sevens, chapter books for in-betweens and over 13s, you know, f stories for adults, really. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Uh, how you can create uh, you know, so fun uh, story? Oh, just look around you. I mean, Asia is such a crazy place, isn't it? You know, just uh, read uh, the newspaper. You, you know why I ask this guy, uh, question? Because I heard a guy, uh, he's uh, uh, writing uh, some uh, you know, joke uh, for 
uh, uh, Hong Kong TVB. Uh, hmm. His name is Mr. Mr. Light. Uh -huh. uh, and he mentioned about he had the, you know, have the way to let the people have, uh, you know, in from the lower point to the highest expectation and suddenly it's different uh, result. Yeah, uh, yes, yeah, so the, the unexpected element. Yeah. yeah, in fact, I'm glad you said that because I can give you an example of that. <laughs> um, uh, okay, we live in such a funny part of the world. I get this press release regularly from North Korea <laughs> and it says, the North Koreans are going to destroy the United States. And they, it usually comes with a picture of Kim Jong-un, usually with binoculars. You can't see the United States with binoculars. It's too far away. Also, if you look very closely, he's holding the binoculars upside down. <laughs> okay. So, I mean, Asia is just a funny place. You know, here's my, here's my blog. Um, what does Google mean to you? Toilet paper. In, in Asia, Google is a brand of toilet paper. Um, what does Facebook mean to you? In Asia, Facebook is a chain of retail stores. Um, is this KFC? <laughs> Not quite. Um, what's wrong with this picture? <laughs> so you can see that it's just very easy to find humor. Uh, Burger King in China becomes King Burger. You think anybody will notice? And, and here is the iPhone in China. Does that look like a Nokia to you? So, so um, can anybody tell me what was the original name for this? Crocodile, correct. And look at this slogan. I mean, <coughs> yeah, the Chinese slogan is okay, but the English one, not quite sure what that is about. Now, this sign you see all over India. Now, can anybody guess what the product is? Y yeah. Cold beer, chilled beer. Yeah, yeah. You see this all over Asia. Uh, this, this one you see in northern India, Pakistan. And, you know, Indian guys are skinny and we wear dresses. You know, I mean, like, that's just <laughs> accurate. Now, I particularly like this hotel because um, this was, you know, people, th a lot of Westerners laugh at Asians, but sometimes Asians laugh at Westerners too. The bad hotel is in Germany. Okay, who can tell me in European language what does bad mean? Yeah, it, water, that's right. It means spa, really, or bath or water elements. So this is the spa hotel in Germany. And of course, to Asians it's really funny, the bad hotel. You know, I, I, I often show this picture on my book tours of Europe. I just do it to scare the Europeans. See how big Asia is and see how small Europe is. <laughs> you know? And when they get upset, then I show them this picture. I say, don't worry, Asians love Europeans. This is how we see Europe. These are the countries of Europe. The country of Fendi, Vuitton, Dior, Gucci, you know, and that, uh, that comforts them a bit, you know. You know, this is, a, this is a Western sign. Now, this is the same sign in Beijing. Show your tender heart by leaving the green leaves untouched. The same sign in, uh, in Shanghai, the tiny grass is smiling. Okay, so Asians have a lovely way of, uh, of um, this is from a zoo in India. Please do not annoy, torment, pester, molest, or worry the animals. <laughs> Yeah, we can be really good at English if we want to be. Um, Asians are either too direct or very uh, circular. So here's an example of very direct. Uh, this one is interesting because the uh, Chinese and the English say the opposite, basically. Be careful about falling into the water, the Chinese says, and the English, fall into the water carefully. You know, like an order. This one's from India. Um, ferocious dogs and ghosts. <laughs> yeah. This one, I always bring my, my visitors from, to Hong Kong and they always stop and they say, what does that mean? <laughs> uh, I mean Hong Kong is such a weird place. This is where I live. Um, this is, yeah, I am prosperous, of course, in Chinese. 
Uh, this I cut out from the South China Morning Post. Uh, manager wanted, experienced, necessary, but not essential. This is from the standard. Manager wanted, must be, neither sex. Yeah. <laughs> what does that mean? Michael Jackson, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> I love Asian products. Um, now, I know what a Dorito is. Do you know what a Dorito is? It's a, like a corn chip. But what I don't know is what they're doing <laughs> and why they are so happy. <laughs> um, you know about weasel poop coffee. You know, coffee pooped by a weasel. Um, this sort of thing Westerners like, the Soon Fat restaurant, of course, very positive in Chinese. So Long Investment is a, gr is a brokerage run by a guy called Mr. So and Mr. Long. They had no idea that So Long means goodbye in, um, in English. Um, uh, bin is a, is a means son of in the Muslim languages. So Batman, son of Superman, and so on. <laughs> Feng Shui compasses are interesting. Um, they point to the south. And if you look at ancient maps of, uh, of the world, so this is Africa up here. This is uh, Asia down here. This is Russia up here. So in fact, south is at the top. So this is, um, this is the Asian map of the world, uh, how, it, how it originally uh, stood like. It's funny, on my book tour of Australia, I showed them this and they loved the map. Here's Australia. And they hated it in UK, because UK becomes this, you know, horrible little dot down here, insignificant, you know. <laughs> so you can see, uh, seeing the world from an Asian point of view is just funny. Here's a typical interview in China. You see, the government provides the camera, the mic, and everything the public says. <laughs> so here's another example from Guando. Typical Asian signs. <laughs> see, Asian personality, go round problems, don't confront them. Um, I've always been fascinated by Asian English. This is a road sign in uh, near Kuala Lumpur. Um, you can see the sign writer has added a few words of his own. I hate all of you. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Often funny signs actually reveal what you really feel. This, no surprise, this was taken in mainland China, anti-Japanese. This one was taken in India. As you can see, Asians are very sexist. Do not gossip, let him drive. <laughs> uh, and this one in Japan. Uh, I, I rather like this, very philosophical. Today is under construction. Thank you for understanding. <clears throat> so, as you can see, um, I get lots of, uh, of input. Diet water sells very well in Asia, but you're not allowed to sell it in the West. Because, of course, you know, it's a, it's a trick. Water doesn't have any calories, you know, Asian products, uh, is it Hello Kitty AK-47, um, the Pokemon Jumbo Jet. This is an interesting one. Red Bull is a very popular Western product, product, but do you know what it is? Any older Asians here? It's actually this. This has been on the shelves in Hong Kong and Malaysia and China for at least 40 years. Exactly the same product, you know. Here's a, here's a good one. About 15 years ago, a psychotherapist came to Hong Kong. There weren't many psychotherapists in, in Hong Kong at the time. He got his name cards made in two days, and this is what they said. <clears throat> <laughs> the name card maker corrected the spelling because he'd never come across the word psychotherapist. You know? <laughs> yeah. um, another sign from a zoo in India. Only those who strongly believe in rebirth should risk going near. Um, let me just say a few words about creativity. Asians are very good at putting up buildings, okay? We're very good, but we, we have a different sort of creativity. We, we're not very artistic, so we can't think of names. So what's the central part of Hong Kong called? Central. What's the building in the middle of central called? Central building. What's the tower opposite called? Central Tower. You know, Hong Kong, uh, Paris has the Seine, London has the, the Thames. What's our body of water called? The Harbour. You know, so we are very uncreative. We have a building called Skyscraper. 
in Hong Kong in in uh, in uh, Tin Hao. Um, <clears throat> occasionally, we start to be creative. So we have greenish building, which is white. We have newish building, uh, which is very old. We have adjoining building. Um, the quite good Chinese restaurant that was on. Um, I used to go there for lunch every day, and the menu, the signature dish, quite good noodles. And it was pretty accurate because the noodles were not great. A vegetarian restaurant that used to be in uh, Stanley Street. Anybody been there? You know, if you go into a vegetarian restaurant, all the girls, all the waitresses had a, a name tag here. And every name tag said, waitress. So the name tags differentiated the girls from the fish and the plants and the furniture, you know. Okay, so I'm a being, being a bit cruel, but I think Asians are very creative in other ways. You know, we have what they call the can-do um, uh, belief. You know, nothing is too heavy or too big to carry in Asia. Um, you know, I mean, we've seen these things, uh, you know, anybody who's traveled in China, nothing is too delicate. We see these things on the road everywhere. You don't want to drive in China too much. Unfortunately, this happens. Uh, this guy has got the world's worst job. So if you hate your job, just think about this guy. He has to hold the target for the PLA, you know. So anyway, this, this is the stuff I get sent in for my, for my website. And you can see where I get my ideas uh, from. You know, before this session ends, I've got a little surprise to play on this guy here. Uh, last night, I had a meeting with my publishers, uh, Pete Spurrier and... Um, and uh, Marshall, uh, 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 Marshall Moore, and um, we totted up all the money that this book had made. And so um, I've got a little gift for ICM, which is uh, Peter's uh, charity. So I want you to open that and see what's in there, <laughs> Peter. Oh. Yeah. Well, it might surprise you a little bit. All those pictures <laughs> Okay, it's a portion of rice. Now, one of the things Peter does, his charity does, is he, uh, they um, b create uh, rice banks for the, for the poorest of the poor. And there's a check in there as well. So, um, so uh, a big thank you to all of you, especially those of you who bought the book, and especially to Jason, who've, uh, whose humor has helped me to write the book. Uh, but, um, but I hope we can... How many, how many portions of rice do you think we can buy with that? The, um, well, like, uh, with, with that, what we can do is... There's, we do lots of different programs, but one of our, one of our main ones is actually um, gathering malnourished children and actually putting them through feeding centers for around 16 weeks. So, yeah, we can, we can like... And then feeding them every single day for 16 weeks so that you can actually get them from... Uh, severely malnourished up to a normal body weight while educating their parents mm -hmm. and actually so that so that you can actually propel them on you don't need to actually continuously feed them feed them feed them because the parents and the families actually just need that little bit of a kickstart so mm -hmm. our plan will be to get around 45 children probably and actually just s save their lives now but then actually educate their parents to to build a future for the for the 45 families and giving them livelihoods and helping feed them so incredible to what he can do so thank you so much <laughs> That's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fatachi and Mr. Fry for the inspiring and humorous sharing. Um, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to ask our speaker now. Do you have any questions? Yes, it's Liana, isn't it? Yes, thank you. Um, yes, I'm just wondering about the new prize you're yeah. um, talking about there. Can you tell us a little bit more? Um, and who the judges will be. Yeah. Oh, it's really be. cool, actually, because um, we decided we hated book prizes because they're always judged by boring old professors, usually a panel of professors, uh, and they choose great books, books that are great for professors to read, but not for the rest of us. So the new book prize will be judged by readers, people who run book clubs, people who do book reviews, sort of real, people who love books and love stories. So they'll pick stories that are great stories, but also fun to read stories. Um, like for example, you know, the James Bond stories or the Harry Potter stories, these sort of stories, they're great stories, but they would never win a book prize. Uh, and that's, that somehow doesn't feel right to me. Um, so it'll be judged by 
by readers rather than professors. And the really cool thing is we contacted loads of writers and we said, what would you like for a prize? Would you like a fancy plaque? Would you like, uh, would you like a lump of cash? And they said, what we would really like is a contract with a really famous publisher. So I called up the really famous publishers and I said, can you guarantee a contract uh, for whoever wins this prize? And they said, yes. So the prize will be a contract with a, with a publisher that we'll have heard of, you know. So, so I can't announce it yet. It's going to be announced in a couple of months. But uh, yeah, so it'll be a great uh, contract with a proper publisher. And as I say, there's a shortage of writers in Asia. So, uh, you know, so, so if you've got a book in that bottom drawer or an idea, you know, this is the, the time to write. Other book prizes, you have to have a certain passport, like... Um, <laughs> I mentioned the Booker and the, and the, uh, the other one, the uh, Pulitzer. The Man Asian Prize, you have to have an Asian passport. But for this book prize, we don't care what passport you have. What we'll do is we'll set a theme. So, for example, next year, the, the theme for the first year will be East and West. Okay, so that's a nice broad theme. Okay, East, East, East meets West, perhaps. Uh, and so we care about the, the, the passports of your characters in your book. We, will, we, we need Easterners as well as Westerners, uh, but you yourself won't need to have a particular prize. Yeah, worldreadersaward.com is uh, where you can find out more information about that or sign up, yeah. yeah good. Any other questions? Yes, young man on the left. Uh, one of the questions I have is, what type of humor, what genre of humor do you think mm -hmm. resonates most with you? What, what genre of humor? Yeah, you, you yeah. mentioned mm. that. You, I mean, you, you've been sent Muslim humor, you've right, been right. sent Christian humor, yeah. you've been sent communist humor. What, what do you yeah. think would, would be m uh, funny yeah. to most of Asia? You know, I like, I like sarcastic humor because it's, it's tricky. Like, let me give you an example. When I was working at the South China Morning Post, I once was in a bad mood and I wrote in my column, Half the companies on the Hong Kong stock market are run by crooks. Anyway, I got some very angry phone calls, and the editor called me in and said, you can't write this. But it's his fault. He never checks my column, you know. So he said, you know, you're supposed to be the censor, you know. Um, anyway, so he said, you write a retraction tomorrow. So the next day, I put in my column... Um, I, I uh, correction to yesterday's article, half the companies on the Hong Kong stock market are not crooks. Fine, <laughs> no problem, <laughs> no complaints. You can see just a little bit of, you see, if you get sarcasm, you realize I'm just saying the same thing again, but you know, the businessmen obviously didn't get it. He's, you know, correction, good. You know, <laughs> So, yeah, so sarcasm is my favorite, I think. Did you know sarcasm was, was uh, uh, the first, the earliest example of sarcasm is in the Bible, in the Old Testament. Um, you know, King, King David was a bit wacko. There's a bit where King David is brought be before the king of Ashish, I believe it is. And the king uh, says, we have brought this guy to meet you. And King David was famous for dancing in the temple and being a total wacko. <clears throat> and the king slaps his head and says, oh, I was running short of madmen. And I think in the original Bible, it says something like, a shortage of madmen hath I, or something. But that's the first known example of sarcasm. So, you know, sarcasm is thousands of years old. So that's nice to know. Yeah. I think we have one more question over here, was it? Yeah. Okay, well, can we do the young lady over here? Because she's, she's a youngster, and, th and then we'll do you, sir. Yes? Did you like to write as a kid? Oh, did I like to write as a kid? How old are you, can I ask? Ten. Ten. That's a good age to start, you know. I think I wrote my first book when I was seven. I wrote my first story. And a yeah, yeah, I wrote, I wrote when I was seven. And I wrote this story, and I drew a picture. And I, I went to my uncle, and I had this idea. She said, I wrote this story. Give me money. <laughs> and he gave me like a dollar for it. So I thought, wow. So then the next day I wrote loads of stories and I went to all the grown-ups I, I, I knew. And you see, if you're a kid, you're cute, you know, you especially. You can do this. You go up to grown-ups 
and you give them a story and you say, I'm a cute kid and I wrote this story. Give me money. <laughs> and it works, you know, and like 40 years later, I'm doing the same thing. I go up to, I go up to Scholastic, you know, I wrote this story, give me money, yeah. you know, and then I can give it to him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good, yeah, and your question, sir? I used to read you thrice a week at the standard, oh, right. and you yeah. bec become scarcer nowadays. Once yeah. a week. What happened? <laughs> right. Yeah, I got I I got three book contracts at once, so I thought right, okay, I'm going to do four days a week of books and one day a week of columns. So I apologise to standard readers uh, that uh, I'm only in there once a week now on Mondays. Um, but the, the, but uh, actually, um, you know, there, there's a bit of a trick going on there, which I'll confess to. That isn't really a column. I don't really work for the standard at all. That column goes all around Asia to different places and almost never mentions Hong Kong because I pretend to be everybody's local columnist. You know, so I get hundreds of letters from Bangladesh and Malaysia and Indonesia and they all think I'm, I'm one of them. Um, and that's why I try not to mention specific things in that column. Once, about two years ago, I had to mention a specific road uh, Victoria Road in Pot Fulham. So I just put down that name and I did a bit of research. You know what I found? There's a Victoria Road in every country because the British were like the best travelers. And the first thing they did when they went to any country was start a Victoria Road. And then they left usually, that's all they did. So um, there's a Victoria Road in all the countries where my column was printed. So I got away with it. So, you know. If you go up, to, if you go to Bangladesh or Sri Lanka or anywhere, India, and you'll say, do you know that local columnist, Yuri Vitachi? They'll say, oh yeah, yeah, he's our local newspaper columnist, mm. you know? And you know, I've never been within a thousand miles of Bangladesh probably, but they all think I live there. So anyway, so you now know my secret. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think we've, uh, we're out of time, aren't we? You, you may heard about Tony Chen, about the Feng Shui Master. Oh, yeah. Okay. Will you think about to write a story about it? About, about, <laughs> about the crooked Feng Shui Master. Yes, you know, actually I ha have done a, a, few, a few like that. This, he's talking about Tony Chan, who's now in prison for, you know. I mean, this guy, he got $3 billion and it wasn't enough. You know, this is punishment for greed, isn't it? You know? Now, if somebody gave you, if your girlfriend gave you $3 billion, would you say, thank you? <laughs> or would you say, I want more? You know, so he got punished, I think, for, for, his, for his greed very much. So, yeah, what do you think, Ivan? Yeah? Yeah. 